Good evening. Tonight I'm talking about culture. And uh, even when I was walking in here, and I'm glad that uh, Pastor Shana emphasized it, and I'm sure all the other speakers emphasized it too, that uh, <clears throat> this seminar is but a catalyst. Uh, it's but a catalyst to inspire you to go and find out more and learn more and invest in yourself. Uh, this is, you know, I hope you don't think because now that you've come here, you know everything about marriage. So please come see us as the pastors. Um, and uh, yeah, come see the pastoral team and get counseling. I think that's kind of the spirit and the overarching theme throughout uh, the seminar is come and get counseling, come and get help. I'm talking about culture. And, um, you know, what is the purpose of culture? Culture is meant to ensure the preservation and continuity of a people. Culture is there to serve us. Culture comes from our communities, uh, our families. You know, there's certain things and days uh, we observe that we get from our community and our family. This is the most important statement. Culture is not static and it's ever evolving. So every time you hear the word culture, please, please think, not static and it's always evolving. It's always changing. I mean, you know, even this platform, case in point, um, I think Pastor Ray two weeks ago wore tackies on stage. It shows you that culture is changing. I mean, he even made fun of, uh, uh, well, not fun, but he says, you know, back in his day, people used to wear three-piece suits and they used to have a clock, you know, on the side here. It shows you that culture is changing. There's a message, you know, that I've shared in the church before, um, you know, that's, that's called Hidden Figures. And I share little examples of how culture has changed over time. Those of you who haven't heard this message, I remember when I was preparing for the message and I, and I spoke to my mom and I said, Ma, you know, what are some of the things that have changed over time that you used to observe as a young girl, as a community, as a family, that you no longer do now to show that culture is always changing, it's not static, it's... Uh, 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 it's ever evolving. I mean, you know, when, you know, my mama said, you know, when a child was born back in the days, um, the umbilical cord used to be, they used to dig up the hole and bury it uh, uh, um, in, in the yard because, you know, that's where we were from. But I ask you the question, where are we from these days? Because Boma Ma Batwakoko Bethlehem, they used to stay in Bethlehem in the free state, they moved to Soweto, and we've moved around in Soweto. So where is home? Because home is going to change. It's, it's not static. Uh, another thing that my mom said has changed, which should, which should change, which I'm still seeing today, is when we have a funeral. You know, uh, you walk into someone's house, and they've moved all the furniture, and all the, 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 the wardrobes and everything, and the mama is sitting on the, on the mattress. And when we go to Sidisa and we go comfort the, 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 you know, the bereaved, we sit on the mattress. But the reason that happened is because people used to live in small houses. So when families used to come over, they needed to move the furniture. Now you guys live in Bryanston Extension 6 and Extension 7. You don't have to move the, 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 the furniture. Amen. I mean, I'm in the music business. Vinyls and CDs and tapes, that's changed. And we have to change with the time or we have to make, uh, uh, we have to make room for ever-changing uh, 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 times. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the, you know, of the royal family. I'm just always kind of uh, amazed as, as to how they've done what they do. And you look at even, you know, Queen Elizabeth, for those of you who are interested. There's things that she wouldn't have done when she got crowned and compared to the things that she's doing now. I mean, even in 1952 when she was crowned, you know, they, I, I remember her, she, she was asked what was her regnal name going to be. So, you know, the royals choose a different name, uh, a, a different to theirs when they're about to serve. And she changed tradition at that time. And she said, no, I'm going to keep my name. The point I'm trying to emphasize that even back in 1952, culture was changing. It's always been changing. It's always been on the move. Everything is subject to change. 
Everything is subject to change. The only being, the only person who doesn't change is God. God does not change. He's the standard by which we can measure all other changes. Amen. God can say things that permeate culture. He doesn't change. And I always say to people, identify yourself with that which does not change. Because you'll still be standing 30 years from now because you've identified yourself with that which does not change. If you identify yourself with your culture, if it's ever changing, what are you going to be left with when it does change? Because it will change. You know, people identify themselves with their finances, with their standing in society, with their marital status, with their parental status, with their standing in society. And that is subject to change. Now, I wanted to lay that foundation, and I, I want to go into a piece that talks about understanding the use of Scripture. Because sometimes we want to uh, uh, um, kind of force our convictions on other people using <laughs> Scripture, and we take it out of context. Okay? Let me, let me say this. Everything in the Bible is truly stated, but is not a statement of truth. Okay? Everything in the Bible is truly stated, but it is not a statement of truth. One of, one of the biggest examples is this scripture. You hear it in funerals. You hear it when people lose things. You, you hear the scripture every time and people take it out of context. Job chapter 1, 21. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It was truly stated, because, but it's not a statement of truth. I want to read Job chapter 1. It's, it's, it's the story of... A, 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 a God, you know, let me read it. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down to it, on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord God and said, does Job, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you. He will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Then, then the, Satan was given permission to basically go in and destroy. So it wasn't the Lord that took away. Are we together on that? So there is no such thing as the Lord taketh and the Lord gives, uh, 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 the, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh, taketh away. The word of God says the blessings of God are without repentance. What God blesses, he does not change his mind about. A statement of truth, I'll give you an example. 1 John chapter uh, uh, 4 verse 7 and 8, it says God is love. That is a statement of truth. And whenever you read the word, uh, 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 read through this, 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 this lens, differentiating between what is truly stated, because everything is truly stated, but what is a statement of truth? What is a statement of truth? I want to go into the next uh, 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 section. Biblical versus culture. This might shock you. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it is biblical. Hmm? Just because it's in the Bible doesn't make it biblical. The Bible and culture collide time and time again, and we have to be able to separate. You have to be able to see what was, uh, uh, um, what was the culture of the time and what is actually biblical. Hmm? What is biblical is John chapter 3, verse 3 to 8. Jesus says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, 
How can a man be born, again, born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That is biblical. It's not up for interpretation. It's biblical. It came out of the very mouth of, of Jesus. Let's go on to dowry, or, you know, as we've come to understand it, lobola. I also used to make this mistake just because I saw it in the Bible. I thought, no, it's biblical. But it actually isn't biblical. It's a cultural issue. It's a cultural issue. So we, we, we can't hold up a, a, a non-existent biblical standard and say the Bible says you must pay lobola. I paid lobola purely, well, I thought it was biblical. But the thing is, I was going to pay it anyway because I, 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 I respected my, you know, my new family. And I was, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sinning against God. I wasn't denying God. It's not an ungodly thing to do, which is, you know, something I'm going to talk about a little bit, a little bit later. So lobola is a cultural practice. And if, when, it's a process requires, it's a process that requires involvement of both families and it's a sign of commitment by potential husband before marriage. And that word commitment jumped out at me because just because you paid Lobola doesn't guarantee your commitment. There's people who've paid one million rand and have gone on the next week and cheated on their wives. There's people, but when I fella fifteen fella. We still committed. Hmm? <clears throat> Gail, Gail knew how much I had. <laughs> she knew how much I had. Kim Lelet, I told her, this is how much I've got. <laughs> she went and told her father, this is how much we're getting. Uh -huh. <laughs> hmm? Everybody, everybody must fall in line because parents, it's not about you. It's about the, the couple. It's about the couple. Hmm? It's about the couple. And, I, and it, it's, 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 it's so important that, that couples protect each other. Protect each other. I protect Gail against my mother because I know my mother. <laughs> she protects me against her side of the family because she knows her side of the family. She can handle their crazy, I handle my crazy. Because once we let this crazy come in here, it's the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the end. Hmm? So dowry and lobola, it's, 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 a cultural, it's a cultural practice. It's, it's not biblical. I mean, I want to read, you, you know, even, even pertaining to women. I read this, and I can't remember what translation it is, and it actually jumped out at me. That, do you realize that even, even Holy Spirit-inspired people who write, who aspire to write Scripture, masculine uh, 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 what's that word I used earlier in Pastor Shana? Masculine. Ta toxic masculinity can still come through. Even, even as a Holy Spirit inspired man writing, your, to your, your, your toxic masculinity bias can come through. And then we take that and make it biblical, but it was somebody's bias coming through. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 14. I desire then that in every place the men should pray lifting holy, hands, uh, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Respectable according to who? Especially in 2020. <laughs> now I'm taking this scripture to 2020. I'll explain to you the context of it now. But as I read it, I was like, Paul, respectable according to who? 
with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold. If this is a biblical standard, all of you would be in trouble tonight, you ladies. <laughs> Even the ones that fast for 40 days and 40 nights, there's some gold on you. Extensions. Can you see that we, we need to be able to separate we need to be kept, as we delve into the Word of God, we need to be able to see. And it comes with practice, it comes with revelation, it comes with asking. I mean, Pastor Sean has been a great resource for me to, to, to be able to differentiate these two things. Because we take things and we want to impose a biblical standard that doesn't exist. It says, Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold of pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness. And what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works? Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. We, and then you want to take this and say, Sheba, born, born, born. Timothy was overwhelmed because the church was bursting at the seams from a growth perspective. Okay, people were getting born again. The church was exploding. So you can imagine, a, a, a different cultures were getting born again. The weirdest of the weirdest, just like us, were being born again and coming into the church. So when all sorts of people are coming into the church, th there's a little bit of chaos. Now Paul, just for order, wrote this letter. And, and when he says, you, he says women are to be quiet because women weren't taught. But I'll, sh I'll share with you later, even though women weren't taught, because if, you can't, if, you, if you're not taught, you can't teach, right? But Jesus is the standard. And I'll unpack a little bit later now, because he sets the standard. Amen. So we need to be careful and, and, and just be able to sift through what is culture and uh, uh, what is biblical. Let me also say this. I think this will set a lot of people free, because there's just too much pressure. Marriage and childbearing are not the only ways to biblical womanhood. Yeah. Having a child or being married isn't the only way to biblical manhood. As a single person, as you sit there, the will of God and the purpose of God can unfold in your life as you are. As you are. We've, we've, we've created this standard limiting people. That when you're not married, you're not good enough. You don't have authority. You can't be used of God. That's rubbish. You know, this, this past weekend, I, I spoke at a... I've developed this, you know, diversity and inclusion a, a keynote, and I was speaking to psychiatrists this, this past weekend. And... Um, we, we, we got talking about, about culture, and one of the professors came to me and he shared to me, and he, uh, because my, my talk has, you know, touches on culture and diversity and inclusion. And, you know, we spoke about how minorities survive in the world from a culture perspective. So my, minorities survive by, by doing three things. The first, the, the first way my, my minorities uh, uh, survive is, is in, in a culture different to theirs is by losing their culture altogether. They get swallowed up by the culture that they're a part of and they're okay with it and they move on. The second way they survive is they separate completely. You know, they have a, a nationalist agenda, if you will. And if you see in, in the world, if, if you're watching, there's really strong kind of nationalist agendas because people are trying to, to protect you know, what they have. But the third way, which, which I believe and the professor was sharing is, is, is the best way, is people to cultivate their cultures in, in, in their own spaces. And once, once, once they've done that, come into the world and find common ground. I learned a new theory called theory of mind. And now, when you come into this, when you come into to, 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 uh, 
uh, to the space that has multiple cultures and you find common ground. There, there, there's, a, there's a principle you need to practice called theory of mind. And theory of mind works like this. I need to put myself in your shoes in terms of how I express my culture. So in some cultures, uh, women walk bare-breasted. And it's fine. Understand what I'm saying? But now if you come to my house and you are bare-breasted, theory of mind says, put yourself in my shoes and let's find common ground. I'm not saying lose yourself, but I'm saying let's find common ground. Because it's, it's all about, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's about building relationships, right? It's not about kind of forcing your convictions on, 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 onto, 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 onto uh, other people. And I believe that's really the, the best way uh, to do it. Anything that challenges the godly standard is, an, is, is unacceptable. What is ungodly? Ungodly is denying or disobeying God. Period. So, culture, we can have fun with it. We, there's, 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 there's a multiplicity of cultures represented here. We can have fun with it. We can harness it. We, we can use it to our own advantage. As long as it doesn't make me deny God and make me a, a second guess God's authority over my life. And every situation needs to be dealt with on merit. Every situation needs to be dealt with on, on, on merit. Fourth section. Asking why is not a problem. From a, from a, from a culture perspective. Especially, you know, I, I think maybe, I don't know, my generation was the first to start to ask why. In the, in the African context. And I guess maybe it's happened over time. You know, but I think, you know, my generation did ask why. I, I'll share different examples. I mean, you know, Pastor Ray shares that story about the woman who used to cook a leg of lamb. Right? She used to chop off the end, and then the little girl asks, why do you chop it off? And then she says, I don't know, your grandmother has always done that. They go to Granny's house, Granny, why do you always chop off the leg of lamb? Uh, because our oven was too small. So there's so many things. There's so many things that you're doing and you don't even know why. No, it's my culture. Why? I own booze. It's my culture. <laughs> I remember my, my, my mother when it came to my daughter's hair. My daughter's got beautiful hair. And my mom says, there was a time, I think my daughter was maybe two years, was like, Gaben, I think it's time now we need to cut Zoe's hair. And then my mom was obviously waiting for me to protect my side of crazy, right? She was like, you deal this one because no one is touching my daughter's hair. And I remember saying to my mom, why? Because I want to know, Ma, why do you need to cut? Cabello, don't ask me. Your aunts cut your hair. Your aunts cut your brother's hair. Don't, don't, don't ask me. And I said, Ma, if you can't give me a good enough answer, you're not touching my daughter's hair. You had your chance with me. You cut my hair. This is my daughter. This is my daughter. Hmm? People, I always feel f from a culture perspective, you know, it's people want to enforce be because of personal and emotional baggage and sometimes political baggage. It's just baggage, you know? And also people want to enforce their culture because what are the neighbors going to say? God forbid if we don't cut our child's hair, but the next door neighbors cut their child's hair. What, what, what are people going to say? And, then, and there's also, you know, I'm seeing in society, there's a level of, of, of blackness. You know, there's, it's, there's, there's all of a sudden these days, it's like, how, what constitutes me being black? There's, there's levels. When you speak a certain way, then you're not black enough. If you speak a certain way, then, no, you are really black. <laughs> hmm? We need to be careful of this level of blackness thing. It's absolute nonsense. I remember my mom. My mom as my goatee. My mom as my goatee was given such a tough time. My mom got married in the 70s, and now you can imagine patriarchy. It's bad now. In the 70s, it was 10 times worse. But my goatee had no 
recourse. They could say nothing. Makoti is, what's Makoti? Daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-laws have had no question, had no say. And my mom vowed, unlike many, many mothers, actually, my mom vowed that she'll never, ever treat her daughter-in-law like that. But how many women who are hurt, because they were treated a certain way, make these young girls go through the worst hell possible? Because they were treated a certain way. Hmm? I remember at, 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 at Kumo's birthday, my son's birthday. You know, my wife's got a nice body. She wears shorts. You know, I'm always, I I'm, wear shorts. She's always, yeah, but is it too short? I'm like, it's not short enough. Wear shorts. <laughs> wear, wear. So we went to, it's Kumo's birthday. It's her son's birthday. What do mothers do at their son's birthday? They're busy, they're running around. So she's wearing tackies, she's wearing shorts, you know? My mom comes with her friends. Obviously now my mom is liberal mama zala, whatever you want to call her. So, so um, the, 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 my, the, my friends come, they look at my mom and go, woo, mom ruti. <laughs> and my mom, knee jerk, she said, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is my makoti. You could do your thing to your makoti. This one is mine. This one is mine. Hmm? I want to close off yeah, with this from a marriage perspective. I think, like I said earlier on, I think the overarching theme is please go to pastors, premarital counseling, not seven days before the wedding. Please, when you've booked, see, you know the things, what do you expect the guy to say or the, or the, or the lady to say who, who, who's sitting in front of you, the pastor? You're getting married in seven days. You obviously, pastor, hey, we're getting married, can you counsel us, please, fast, fast. <laughs> They're not going to turn you away. But you're not taking full advantage of how they can help you. You're not taking full advantage of how they can help you. Six months, minimum, at least, come and get help. One of the best things I did, because what counseling does, it says there's reality and there's expectation. I expect sex this much, the reality is I'm getting this much. <laughs> so where is the gap? It bridges the gap. Hmm? My wife wants a house this big, she expects it, but the reality is she's only getting a house this big. So where's, do you understand? And, we, and from a finances, how are we gonna deal with finances? There's expectation and there's reality. And the thing is, think about it. And people, people I think who get married are, you, you, you're not stupid. You, you, you know, people, you, you step into it, but it's like, you, it's a guessing game. You don't know how she thinks about finances. You don't know what he thinks about finances. You don't know how much debt he has. Uh, you, you don't know how many mashonis as he owes. You, you, you're just going into this thing. Six, month, six months counseling, the pastors are equipped to probe and ask those questions. And the Holy Spirit will make sure that all those things come up. And then after six months, you can decide if I'm going with this or not. Because maybe in the six months, you're going, to under, you, you're going to find out that he's got a, two more other families, one in Namibia and one in Zimbabwe. <laughs> but because you didn't ask, you didn't go through the process. Keep your family in check. Husbands, wives, protect each other. Because when everyone is gone, it's just you two. It's just you two when everybody's gone. So you need to be your best buddies. Amen. I think that's it from me. <laughs> huh? Questions? Yeah, of course, questions. But kifedi te, I know. Yezang di daidi. have questions. <laughs> there, there, there. Eh? 
Yeah. Don't worry, I'll, I'll keep it a bit light. <laughs> I know your comrades run this, so this is just a half marathon. <laughs> um, I probably just wanted to ask, um, with the counseling thing, right? Would you, I'm just trying to decide, when would you think it would be at best? Is it before the engagement or once the engagement has happened? And obviously this is just mere culture. I think in this time and age, it's more about the surprise and the engagement, actually being part of that, you know, you're getting married, right? Sure. So you need to amp it up, get it to a point where, you know, this is not coming. But if you're having counseling even before, you know, it's, it's, it's really almost like now your expectation is there. So when is it going to happen? So that's just a question I like to pose to you. Sure. That's, that's a very good question. You know, uh, my head goes to, you know, I guess the way society has set it up is we as the male have to make our intention clear, right? And I would, I, I would imagine, you know, the lady in question wouldn't step into a counseling room if she didn't know your intentions, you know? So I think, you, you know, our intentions need to be made clear. But what the beautiful thing about counseling is you've, you've made your intentions clear. Look, I like you and, you know, and I think we should go for counseling. Hopefully she's, and we obviously assuming she said yes, right? She says yes, and then if she says yes, obviously there's, she sees potential in the relationship, and then you go for counseling. If it happens that in that counseling period that you find out whatever you want to find out and you don't want to pursue, then it is what it is. You have to make the call because the counseling is set up to, 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 to unearth as much stuff to, 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 to make um, to make you make a quality, to help you make a quality decision. And then at the end of that process, you'll still be able to make a call. But it's, it's, it's vital. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Kabila, thanks for that chat. It was really great. I love your excitement and enthusiasm. <laughs> you kept us laughing. I wanted you to carry on and on. So I've got two questions for you. Older sister, siblings, younger brothers after me. What is your take on fat and set? <laughs> um, you know, these guys have been together for like forever and a day. We call it 10, almost 10 years. Um, they're still, not even 10 years. About five years. <laughs> <laughs> also, About five years, probably half. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, they've decided they want to live with each other, get to know each other, check, check it, you know, check each other out. See if they, you know, they've, they've now got a kid. To cut a long story short, I've got a mom who's very liberal, but I think we've pushed her to, to the limit, yeah. you know, where her siblings, she comes from a family of nine, are saying, what the heck mm. is your son doing? Yeah. Do something about it. This is, you know, not biblical. This is out of control. Mm. You know, I want to hear about that. Yeah. Okay. And then the other question about culture is, you know, us being a young couple, we've been together for 15 years. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Got to celebrate it. Got a great husband. Um, you know, my father's side of the family, uh, I don't want to mention the name, <laughs> no. but they're all about, you've got to know your family tree and your roots and where you come from and who you are and because we feel that that will just take you to the next level of what you should be or what direction you should take. But being a mixed, you know, I, I always say I'm African because my father's side of the family is from Zim, my mom is Kosa, those are two crazy cultures. <laughs> My husband being in Debele and Sutu, what do we teach our kids? Because, oh my gosh, it's chakalaka. I know we are, you know, it's our own culture, you know, which is built on Christ, but it's four cultures that are now, you know, in one. Yeah. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll start with the, with the second question. Um, from your kids and your family, you, you know, it's your, it's your core. You know, you choose 
the, and the only influences that should play a role there are you two. No one should determine from outside how you raise your kids. That's your family, you set the tone, and that's it. In terms of finding out about who you are, I think that's a, it's a beautiful thing, but it shouldn't uh, make you kind of second guess. It, it shouldn't make you feel any less of a person if you don't know who's who. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I think it's, it's a special thing to, 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 you know, to make that journey and find out who's who. I think it's, 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 it's interesting. You know, so, but in terms of your culture and your family, I think you guys kind of set the tone for that. Uh, Faten said, uh, Faten said, I'll speak from my perspective, you know, because I don't want to make kind of statements, you know. It didn't work for me. Okay? It didn't work for me because I feel the longer you take to make a decision, you're never going to make a decision. I, I really feel that if... <laughs> you know in the first six months. You know, you know in the first six months if I'm going to make a call and this is going to be the person that I'm going to be with. You know, and for... And that's kind of my, 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 my stance. But from a fat and perspective, I tried it, and it, it didn't work. You know, you just prolong the inevitable. You know, so, uh, uh, but there's places where people have uh, cohabited, and they got their act together, and they, well, and they got married, and it worked. Excuse me? But they're also not your problem, they're God's problem, you know? You know what I mean? Because what can you do? You've spoken, you've said, you've advised, you've given, you've given advice, but they're not your problem, they're God's problem as well. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you for the message tonight. Um, so, something I've thought about quite often recently is the necessity of going through with the whole marriage process. So, in the sense that a person or two people can choose to commit to each other, right? And I've likened it to, for instance, driving on the road. Um, there's the laws, there's the papers and whatnot that tell you that if you do this, you're gonna have this fine, or you can go to jail if you speed, or if you crash into someone, stuff like that, right? But in the end, what keeps you in between the lines is not those pieces of paper, those laws. It's you choosing to commit mm. to following what you said you were going to do, like when you got your license and stuff. So as a thought, I've just I've questioned, is it really necessary to go through the paperwork and go through the ceremony and stuff? Like, just to make it clear, I plan to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to do it because it's a beautiful process to go through with your person, with your family and all that. But I do just intellectually question its necessity with regards to the whole commitment thing. I've received the argument that, well, if you go through this process, it's more incentive not to divorce and all that stuff. And I'm like, nah, but the, the stats still say that even though people go through with it, sure. still get divorced. So I'll just, just yeah, bouncing. Sure. <laughs> You know, I mean, what are we doing it for, you know? I think... We need to, you know, we need to understand that... And you're right, that the paper doesn't determine, you know, whether you stay faithful or not, all right? But I think we have a responsibility to each other. You know, what, what are we doing? You know, are we, do you want to build a life for yourself? Do you want to leave a legacy? I think, you know, over and above, like a fiduciary responsibility to yourself, there's, they, 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 it, I think it just protects you uh, and helps you build, you know, a, a, a legacy with, with somebody else. You know, so, I don't know. For me, I just think, you know, marriage and, you know, fully committing all the way is, is, the only way is the only way to do it, you know? If you're still questioning, you know, why, then maybe are you ready to get married? 
you know, are you ready to, 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 to make uh, the decision? i ask the question because when, when I'm ready, I think when you're ready, those things are like, it's just what just needs to happen. And this is what I have to do. You know, my marriage needs to be legal. You know, then I'm responsible for somebody. Somebody's responsible for me, you know, and we build a life together. All right, greeting everyone. Uh, my question is, what is the biblical responsibility of the church as far as marriage is concerned, especially during the preparations towards uh, marriage? And what is the biblical responsibility of the family during that process? And how do you as a couple or as a potential couple strike the balance between your family and your church, especially if your family is not born again. Yeah, in that, in that instance, how do, you, how do you strike a balance? So, okay, what is the church's biblical responsibility to the couple? Yes. Ne? Let's start with that one. I believe the church's, the church's biblical responsibility to the couple is to bring God into the picture, is to bring God into the into the union because I really believe it is a it's a it's a union of three it's you your wife and God as, as it's been shared over over the weeks and I believe that is the church's responsibility to make God even all the more evident in your life that you can you know uh, 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 build a foundation your, your marriage the foundation of, of your marriage can be founded upon you know God and the word and his principles that's the church's responsibility so if your family is not born again, and you are, I really, is, and then is your partner born again? Yes. Um, and, so, and where are you getting stuck? Or are you, talk, are you asking for a friend? No, 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 no I'm not asking for a friend. <laughs> Basically, what I've, uh, what I've realized is that uh, most of the times, during this time, we, 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 we tend to give our family a stage to run things their own way. And only afterwards do we now include or involve the church. Uh. So spiritually, are we not missing it there? No, because the, 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 your family born again or not need to be part of your wedding. It's, 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 it's two families coming together. Uh, them preparing and helping with preparations doesn't... Uh, Jesus still sits on the throne of your life. Uh, who you are in Christ, uh, relationally and positionally, does not change. What you, what the responsibility you have is you know what's godly and what's not. If they're organizing and they're getting involved and they're not born again, there's no harm in that, surely. But if they're causing you to, as I said earlier on, if they're causing you to do stuff that is ungodly, which is yes. to deny God, then you have a responsibility to call it out and deal with it. And that there's another reason why, you know, there's another biblical responsibility and the reason why, you know, the counseling and the pastor and the church should be involved because that's just an extra, uh, uh, um, you know, that's just the extra arm of support that you, that, that you can lean, lean, lean on and use in, in times like this because isolation kills. If you think you can deal with it by yourself, you won't be able to take advantage of uh, the infrastructure and the, and, and the pastors and the counseling. They will help you navigate uh, uh, um, um, that situation. Sure. Hi, I'm getting a bit concerned here, and I, 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 I might perhaps come across as overreacting, but I think the Bible is very clear that the context of sex is marriage, and I'm concerned that we're skating around the issue. I, for example, before I got saved, I, I, I cohabited, yes. and God dealt with me on that issue, mm -hmm. and it is a sin. Yeah. And so, and so I, think, I, think, I think we need to be very clear yes. as a church that sex before marriage is a sin. And as a church, we cannot get around that issue. And I think I really need the church to take a strong position on Thank this, you. biblically. We yeah. cannot play around with this. Yeah. Thank you so much.
That was a statement, right? That was a statement. Yes. I, I confirm it, and I think maybe I didn't say it in as many words as you did. There, I was asked about Fatih and said, I said it did not work for me. You know, and I guess you are further elaborating, you know, um, that stance. And that is the church's stance. You know, that is best, best practice. Um, hi, Cabello. I'm asking for a friend here. Um, so there is a show called Marry Me Now. Is a no. show called Marry Me Now? Yeah, I'm already married. No, so I've okay. been married for five years, so no, not asking for me. So um, she wants to propose to her boyfriend. Uh, they've been together for a while. And now that we know that, you know, you're supposed to go through marriage counseling and stuff, and obviously the wedding is going to be a surprise, what would you advise? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how many of the, what's the, what's the stats with those marry me now and getting married in 90 days, you know, those shows, the stats are, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, you know, in terms of how long they last. You, you find your friend has been seeing this guy for, for, for a while, uh, and if they just followed, you know, the counseling process and the process that we're advocating for, they've got a chance. But now diving straight into it and also kind of adding the added pressure of, uh, uh, you know, television and, and all of that stuff, it's going to put so much pressure on that relationship. It really is. I mean, marriage is, is, is no walk in the park. Or, they, you know, they said in the ad the other day, it's a walk in the park, but it's just more like Jurassic Park, and it's true. <laughs> you know, so they're not giving themselves a chance. They're not giving themselves a fair chance. Cool.